Um, am I going to add stuff with channel points? Like what? What do you have in mind? If you think I you if you think I know what I'm doing with this Twitch channel, you're severely mistaken. What do mass people do? I don't know. Drink? Oh, look, Calcmass has discovered the new channel emote. It's our good friend Galb. <laughs> Galb is Gauss. I mean, in America we say Gauss, but in uh, Germany they say Galb. <clears throat> yeah, rock climbing is a popular pastime with mathematicians, as is, well, cycling, hiking. Oh, good. I'm glad you're here, Vectorcom. Tayo I Galb. Running or hiking, sure. Bridge, big one. Um, I actually don't see a whole lot of uh, math people who um, ad openly admit to playing chess. Or go, frankly. I do know one math professor who is like a pretty skilled Go player. No, I don't play chess. Not on the reg anyway. Nice hat. Nice hat on that on that galb. Looks great. <laughs> and uh, I got to think of something for Euler. Because I, I know that we in the channel decided on Wheeler, but I've, I, ugh, it hurts my feelings. Yesterday we were talking about how, yeah, well, Euler and Euler's formula. And how it's so strange that we say Euler, uh, but we also say Euclid. Like, why are they not the same? You think that if it was Euler, it would be Euclid, right? Anyway, so I got to think of an emote for Euler because I, I think Euler is one of the best mathematicians to have ever, ever lived. Or at least in the top 1,000. At the very least in the top 1,000. Have I heard of Nurture's Theorem? Uh, is that the one from physics? That symmetries give, lo give rise to conservation laws? I have heard of it. I actually don't totally understand it but I have a very superficial knowledge of it put it that way see in German they spell it G-A-U-B yeah exactly Gary and so um oh Christos go ahead At G A U B. And so, you know, in German it's pronounced Gaub. But here in the in the States, it's pronounced it's pronounced Gauss because we're pretty ignorant Americans, you know? And as is the case with so many things, through American cultural hegemony, this Gauss pronunciation has spread to the entire world. So, yeah, scalp. Good. I mean, it's to the point now where uh, the German government is trying to get rid of capital B from their um, language. They don't want it anymore. No, I didn't. I listen. I downloaded the thing, and then it, it was a dot jar file, and then I freaked out. Okay, so I'm still scared of it. I was following their instructions. I found a dot jar file that I was supposed to click on, and then I freaked out because um, I mean, 
how what it could do anything to me couldn't it <laughs> i mean it could do anything right <laughs> Oh, I have Java. Run it in a VM. Oh, see, now that's smart. Yeah, but see, like, why should I trust this GitHub thing? Normal, yes, I'm scared of .exes too. I'm scared of them. Oh, come on. You can't ask me. You're not going to ask me to read source code, are you? What does that what is what difference does that make? Can't they like delete my crap? I can assume it's fine. Why? Or can't they like turn my machine? I don't know. Whatever. I trust Linux because there is a community of people there who are experts who all say Linux is trustworthy. I don't have such assur assurances when it comes to a random GitHub that contains code for a Twitch bot. I don't mind appealing to the experts, appealing to authorities. I like it because then I don't have to think about it. Yeah, two people looking to mine Bitcoin or something. How do I know? Maybe they want my nudes. Then what? My nudes are just out there? <laughs> What's something in your field that you don't understand? Like a math concept that I just can't get my, or wrap my head around? Oh, what, 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 is, a, what is the meta? Is it Ethereum coin or something? I don't know how I don't know any about any of these things. Somebody just told me to put all my money in there, so I did. Okay, that's all. I think that I've never really understood fully, despite having read the definition several times, um, sort of, or the definitions or the ideas several times. Um, what's happening in algebraic geometry? which is a huge field, obviously. Um, but I don't think I really understand what's happening in that field. Uh, obviously th stuff, I, I mean, this is gonna be true about any field. You go deep enough and then y you're lost, right? Um, but algebraic geometry is a big one. I know this. And I think that there are a lot of aspects of it that I'm severely ignorant of, which probably I shouldn't be, but my disposition is such that that's the way it shook out. Um, if I could redo my life and choose, so for example, I know what a sheaf is. All right, I think I do anyway, or a pre-sheaf anyway. It's easy to say, but like people start talking about schemes and then I'm lost. I don't know what they're talking about. And I really should because I know a lot of, they're very important put it that way um like i do i don't know what a scheme is i couldn't tell begin to tell you it's just a locally ring space you, you're not allowed to say that out loud okay if i could redo my life and choose a different path in math what would i do well i would have been exposed i would have been exposed to mathematics at a much earlier age i mean like um the kind of mathematics that mathematicians do at a much earlier age. And I don't know where that would lead. Maybe I would be talking about schemes right now and etal cohomologies and all of that. I don't know. It's always weird to contemplate the counterfactuals. 
This Q is for math help. So sometimes when things get hectic in the channel, which isn't always, but sometimes, um, it's good to have a queue of users so that I, the people who ask questions can join an orderly queue and we can answer them in turn so that nobody feels ignored. Because I'm like positive that you type bang join, bang join, exclamation point join. Um, I'm having trouble trying to visualize the three sphere, the three dimensional generalization of a two sphere. What would a three sphere universe look like? So, okay, let's talk about the two sphere for a sec, okay? Here is a great way of thinking about the two sphere. The two sphere is the plane with a point at infinity. And you can kind of, let's, let me, let me focus and make this big so that you can see my hand moving. It's the plane with a point at infinity. The idea being that you sort of wrap the plane around what you, the, the thing that you want, the, the, the two sphere. And it, uh, there's a little hole at the top at the North pole that gets plugged by a, um, point at infinity. This is really made, um, uh, this idea is really made very powerful, or I think it's easy to visualize when you think about what's called stereographic projection. So if you think about, so imagine that the two sphere, the thing that you want is sitting above the plane and that it's South pole is living at the origin of the two dimensional plane. Now imagine putting a light source at the North pole then there will be a bijection between points in the plane and points on the sphere other than the North Pole. Does that make sense? How? You can imagine light rays emanating from the North Pole, passing through the sphere, and then hitting the plane. It's better if I draw a picture, isn't it? So, uh, window and face. Why does this happen? Look at this guy. He's he's purple now. I don't know why that happens. So you can imagine I wonder if flammable masks will appreciate Galb. What do you think? So here's the XY plane, for example. And you can imagine parking a sphere, a two-dimensional sphere, so that its south pole touches the origin here. Here we go. And then here we go. There's a two-dimensional sphere, okay? Judge me all you want, that's a two-dimensional sphere. And here is the North Pole of the two-dimensional sphere. So we can imagine parking a light source right there that will illuminate in all directions. In particular, there will be light rays which pa go from this uh, North Pole, which pass through the, the sphere, okay? And then which hit the XY plane in a certain point. And in this way, we establish a bijection between the points in the plane and almost all the points in the sphere. The only point that would be excluded is the North Pole. So doing this sort of backwards, what you can do is you can kind of think of this, uh, the two dimensional plane sort of wrapping around the sphere via this the inverse stereographic projection and then plugging up the the gap namely the north pole with a point at quote unquote infinity this conception of the two dimensional sphere um, is very frequently used for example in the context of complex analysis um, there you sometimes find it convenient uh, to instead of thinking about functions of the complex plane, you might think about functions of the uh, two-dimensional sphere 
which you view as the complex plane with a point at infinity. How do you prove it? Well, so I think you can be pretty goddamn explicit about the bijection. Like, if you have coordinates uh, for this sphere in R3, I think you can be incredibly explicit about this uh, this stereographic projection. Like, you can write it down. Um, And so that's cool. Now, how do we think about the three-dimensional sphere? Okay. Well, it's a similar kind of game now. You just kick everything up a dimension. You think about R3, R3, and it sort of gets wrapped around in such a way that uh, what you end up with is a wrapped around a point at infinity. You add a point at infinity to R3, and that is a very common way of visualizing the three sphere. In fact, I pretty much guarantee that whenever ta somebody thinks about the three sphere like a topologist is thinking about a three sphere they're almost certainly imagining just basically r3 with an additional point up there okay so they might imagine like if i fly up for some distance some amount eventually i'll find myself back where i was that kind of thing because i pass through the point at infinity up there which is by the way only a finite distance away from me um, so geometrically, right, is, this isn't the greatest, but topologically it's fine. You, do you understand what I'm saying? So again, how do you visualize it? You visualize S3 as R3 with a point at infinity. That stereographic projection thing is really cool, by the way. It's a conformal transformation, which means it preserves angles. So like circles go to circles, straight lines go to circles or whatever, or straight lines or whatever. Pretty cool. But what is the importance of homomorphisms when proving isomorphisms? Well, okay, so it is a weird question. Because isomorph it's not a dumb question, but it is a weird question. It just feels weird. Um I so that's a valuable piece of datum in and of itself, okay? Uh that it just feels weird to somebody who's been through the grind. An isomorphism is, of course, an example of a homomorphism. It's a type of homomorphism, as you know. I feel like there must be more context. Right. That's correct, Devil Honor. That's what an isomorphism is by definition. Good. So, what we want out of the concept of isomorphism is the following idea that if we are focused on just the group structure on just the group structure we might see that same abstract group emerge in different guises so here's an example of that you are I, I hope you're familiar with the integers mod n at this point in your life. The integers mod n, of course, are is the group consisting of uh, uh, the number. You, you, you can think of it as consisting of equivalence classes of integers modulo n, which we can represent using the numbers 0 through n minus 1. And what we do is we can set up a group structure on this object, on this set of equivalence classes. We can set up a group structure. So um, how does that group structure work? We add two representatives of an equivalence class together. And then we look at its equivalence class mod n. All I'm saying is like, for instance, in z mod 3z, 2 plus 2 equals 1. Right? We take 2 plus 2, which is 4, but 4 is equally well represented by 1, mod 3. Make sense? Hi, Skugget. Now, that's one way in which this particular group arises. Here's another way which it arises. It's sometimes denoted Cn. This is, uh, let's say, um, 
the cyclic group of order n, we might write this thing multiplicatively uh, like this. We might write it like a, a generated by a, let's say. Well, I don't, won't even worry about that. Uh, one a, a squared, all the way up to a n minus one, right? The key thing here, the isomorphism thing, is that in fact, as if as far as group theory is concerned, if we are focused with groups on groups, these two groups are totally identical. If all we uh, are paying attention to, to is the abstract group structure then really there's no reason to be distinguishing one group from another. There is no theorem in group theory which is going to distinguish between these two groups. They are isomorphic as groups. We might see this in a different guise as well. Like, for example, um, uh, we could call, I don't know, symmetries of our rotate like orientation preserving symmetries of the uh, regular n-gon so this is orientation preserving symmetries of a regular n-gon now, obviously, these are all different sets. They are not isomorphic as sets. These are, ra I don't want to say radically different, but they are different sets. This set here consists of equivalence classes of integers. This set here consists of, well, I don't know, like abstract symbols, letters, okay? Whereas this guy here consists of transformations uh, of the plane, actually. Which, uh, are, which arise as symmetries of a regular um, n-gon. But if all you care about is groups, then all of these groups are basically identical. There's no reason to distinguish them within group theory. I forgot why I was talking about this. Oh, right. We need the homomorphism. So they're clearly all isomorphic as sets. No question about that, right? As sets, they're all isomorphic. Why? Because they've all got the same number of elements. Good. The reason is because each of these sets, okay, has a group structure on it as well that we want to pay attention to if we want to declare these as the same groups. So let's just back up. Let's take an even simpler example, okay? There's two groups that I, I know you know about. There's Z mod 4Z, okay? And there, so this is one group. And here's another group, Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z, sometimes called the, the Klein 4 group. Or if you're a German, the Klein Fia Gruppe, right? So this is a, a group with four elements. This is also a group with four elements, right? But they are not the same group. They are not isomorphic as groups. These are non-isomorphic groups. Like you cannot find a bijection from this group to that group, which is also a homomorphism. Can't do it. Impossible. It's the group structure which needs to be preserved in order for us to declare that these are the same group. It's incredibly important. These three groups really are all the same group. And not only are there bijections between them, there are bijections which preserve the group Structure. That's the sort of um, phrase that you want to let enter into your lexicon. 
That's the purpose of the homomorphism bit of the definition of isomorphism. Sorry, that was probably very belabored when I could have just given you this example and it probably would have been the most illuminating. Can I define homomorphism and isomorphism? Sure. Um, definition. So, uh, let me just think, think, think. I know these definitions, right? They're like some, they're in there. Suppose G and H are groups. A function F, which goes from G to H, is a homomorphism. If for all G and G one and G two in G, we have uh, F of G one G two is equal to F of G one times f of g2. So this one right here, g1, g2, this is a product in the group g. This is the using the group multiplication, the notion of multiplication of, uh, in the group g. Whereas over here, this multiplication is in the group h. So this is the definition of a homo, group homomorphism. Um, a group homomorphism, what? Here. Why? Because what? I need you. For what? Wait, okay. Oh. Is an isomorphism, let me finish writing this, Yoshi. A group homomorphism is an isomorphism if it is a bijection. I can't believe I haven't explored this yet, actually. Vector realm. How have I not explored this? <laughs> Does it bother me that the speed of light is not 300 million meters per second? Sure, but it is like 186,000 miles an hour, right? <laughs> Did you really convert it <laughs> into feet per fortnight? <laughs> yeah, what is lambda calculus? If somebody wants to talk, tell us what Lambda calculus is, they can come on Discord and educate us. Hey, yeah, you know, we should have people come on Discord, not just for questions, but to educate us. Because you all know so much that I don't know. What's my favorite mathematician, Wheeler? See, Wheeler sounds like a real mathematician, like Wheeler. Like there's a physicist named Wheeler. I know this. Isn't it weird that there isn't a math podcast? Or is there one? I don't really know, actually. I don't like, I don't dislike Stephen Wolfram. I like him. Erdish. Hey, how do you say handle or handle? How do you say the composer H A N D E L in German? Do you say Handel or do you say Handel? I mean, I know you don't say handle. Do you say Handel? Handel or Hendel? Is it A, Hendel? Or B, Hendel? Okay, first one.
forvo.com. All the words pronounce all the words in the world pronounce. This is amazing. I had no idea this site existed. Wait, so I don't know how to type an umlaut. <laughs> uh, or handles. Copy Forvo. George Friedrich Handel. Georg Friedrich Händel. Händel. Handel. Handel. Wait. Handel. Handel. Händel. Händel. Oder Georg Friedrich Händel. Händel. Wait, what? Karl Friedrich Gauss. Wow. Karl Friedrich Gauss. What? That's in Spain. That's Spain. I don't know why it wants me to see it in Spain. I'm not sure how that happened on this site, but it pointed me to Spain. How do they say it in English? Gauss. Carl Friedrich Gauss. And how do they say it in German? Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, I can't seem to find it in German. Or rather, not in the original German. I'm sure we could find it in uh, modern German after American cultural hegemony had taken place, as we've Sad. If a corona test is accurate in 90% of cases and might show an incorrect result in 10% of the cases, what is the probability of a true positive? Wait, hold on, hold up, hold up. Galbe, 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 Galbe. Galbe, 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 Galbe. Okay, this is great. Thank you, Sesco Pedalianistic. <laughs> um, don't you? You need to know. You <laughs> need to know. You need to know what the probability of having it, whether or not you've had a corona test is right you will in other words um like what does it mean to be a true positive it means that you have the disease uh and the test says that you have the disease right so you need to know some background information like what for example what is the probability that any particular individual in the population has coronavirus um you asked me if getting married is worth it yes I mean, if you find the right person. And actually, I think that finding the right person is probably one of the most important decisions that you can make in your life. But it's nice to have somebody that you like, that you love, and who loves you. Having your back and stuff.
Um, can I give you a rundown of homology again? Because I'm trying to read a proof of Borsuk Ulam, and I need it. Um, from scratch, or what? What is it that you want to see? Bayes theorem. Bayes theorem. Yeah, Bayes theorem is what Eisenwave needs. A right angle triangle has a side length of length one. From scratch, you barely understand it. Okay, I will do that. Uh, okay, let's do this one real quick. A silent winner, because this one will be fast, whereas the homology one's slower. It's longer. Um, so a right triangle has a side length one fixed on the x-axis and uh, a hypotenuse forming an angle of theta with respect to the x-axis. So we have a triangle that looks like this. At what rate is the area of the triangle increasing with respect to theta? Okay, so uh, obviously this is gonna depend on how theta is changing, we know that. What really what we want is some kind of relationship between the area and theta. That's what we would like to know. So it sure would be nice if we could write down an expression, let's say, for this opposite angle here. Because if there, uh, if there is an expression for the opposite angle in terms of theta, well, it's easy to write down the area then. So uh, for example, what is that thing? What is the thing about um, ratios of sides in um, a right triangle? What is that thing called again? I forgot. What is it called? Say it. You know what the thing I'm talking about? No, not that. Something else. No, not that. Something else. It's like letters in weird order. Yeah, that thing. Do you all know that thing? Look at what calc math just said. Have you heard of that in your life before? Yeah, that thing. Awesome, cool, that's great. So what that says, one fact that we can use, uh, we can draw from that, that word, the knowledge somehow, that the tangent of an angle in a right triangle is equal to the ratio of the opposite leg divided by the uh, adjacent leg. So the tangent of theta, in other words, is equal to whatever the length of this thing here is, we can call it question mark, question mark over one. Does that make sense? So if we solve for question mark, we learn that question mark is equal to tangent theta. Tell me that you like it. Tell me that you like it, silent winner. You love it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You do. Now, the area of this triangle. Well, uh, note that the area is obviously going to depend on theta, right? Just use your common sense thingers inside your brain. As theta changes, the area is going to... I hate the way that looks. As the area changes... I don't like that theta either, but we'll leave it. Um, as the area... Sorry, as theta changes, the area will change. So area is going to be a function of theta. Agreed? And now we can be explicit and write down what that area is. Because the area of a right triangle or any triangle is one half the base times the height, right? We learned this in grade school. So this is equal to one half tangent theta, which is the height times the base, which is one. But nobody's going to write that. One. Do you like it? So now what we can do to find the rate of change of area as theta changes is we can compute d area, d theta. We can compute the derivative of the area with respect to theta. 
So if we do dd theta to this side, then we do dd theta to that side. So if we do that, what we get is 1 half uh, is a secant, secant squared theta. Secant. We in America have secant. Do you know what secant is, silent winner? For some people, it's not continental enough. Okay, great, excellent. Good. Uh, now listen, this is the rate of change of area with respect to theta. But say you wanted, you had some dyna, dynamical system or dynamical function of theta, like theta maybe itself was a function of time, right? Imagine that theta was a function of time. Then maybe you'd be interested in like dA, d area rather, dt. You could be interested in that. In which case, what you might be interested in is d, I don't know why I'm doing this because you didn't ask this but sometimes this often arises. What you could do is use the chain rule. So you could do d area dt, d area d theta times d theta dt, right? So d area d theta we just did. So this quantity here would be one half secant squared theta multiplied by d theta dt. So you'd have to know what that is if you're not given a, maybe you're given a formula for theta, how it depends on t or something like that. In any case, this is, how the area would change with time, say, if t standard for time, stood for time. I said standard. Feel free to make fun of me. Okay, user temporarily suspended. More questions about marriage? You're welcome, silent winner. Oh, skug it, no, right, skug it. Thank you for reminding me because, you know, this, this thing, this thing, no good. Uh, okay, I'm going to do singular homology then. So, do you know what an n simplex is? Okay, so, um, yeah, so... We're going to define C N of X, where X is a topological space, to be equal to the free abelian group generated by singular N simplices. So what this what is a singular N simplex? A singular n simplex is just a map from the n simplex, which I'm going to denote like this. Uh, sorry, a, a map from the singular. Sorry, sorry, a, a, a map from the n simplex into your space X. It's a continuous map. That's all. Any old continuous map. And then we're going to take the free abelian group generated by these. So what's your sense of this? This is enormous, ginormous. Any set generates a free abelian group. So what you take are finite linear combinations of these maps. Where the, int sorry, with the integer coefficients. Linear, no, no, not linear combinations in X, just um, formal linear combinations. So like imagine you have an F1, which represents some map of the simplex 
n simplex into x, and you have an f2, which rep represents perhaps a slightly different map of the n simplex into x, and an f3 and an f4, of course you're going to have potentially uncountably many of these. You're going to have an enormous number of such singular n simplices. And then what you're going to do is take formal sums, formal linear combinations of these things with integer coefficients. It's enormous. It's you don't try to imagine it. There is a well, I don't know if do you like this these words. There is a functor from sets to free abelian groups, just like a, a construction where you take basically as many elements as there are in your set you take um, a copy of Z. Mm -hmm. There's no, and there's no relations, right? So like if you, if you're sl a slightly different singular N simplex, there's no way of like combining those things together. Just purely formal sums. From N into Z times the set of such functions. Uh, 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 sure. Uh, well, N, uh, will you, what? Wait, N? Why N? Yeah, finite formal sums. Finite formal sums. Yes. So that would be 4a plus 3b. But this is much, much bigger than just two, a 2 Of course, you know this. I'm just saying. This is a, not just a, a, a free abelian group on a two-element set. This is typically uncountably large, right? Maybe, yeah, very, very, very big. Yep. So then, um, there is a what's called a boundary homomorphism, which takes the bound. So this is I'm going to call it boundary. Do I want to call it this? Yeah. So this will be a map which runs from C n of x to C n minus one of x. It's called the boundary homomorphism or boundary that's what it's called and that name is evocative because what it does is it takes a singular so if I tell you what this thing does to one of these maps one of these uh, singular n simplices then you'll sorry if I tell you what it does to every singular n simplex then you'll know what it does on the entire free abelian group generated by these things by extending linearly. Does that make sense? Yes, including the interior. Yeah. So this thing is really just like topologically a ball, an n ball an n-dimensional ball. But it's got some combinatorial structure on it that makes it into an n-simplex. Yeah. All right. So how do we think about this boundary map? Um, great question. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to think of this n-simplex as being like as having um n plus one vertices right does this make sense like for example um a zero simplex consists of one vertex it's just a dumb single point a one simplex has two points and an edge a one-dimensional line segment between them 
two simplex has three vertices and three edges and a two-dimensional face inside of it okay so this thing has n plus one vertices that we're going to denote uh we're going to denote this guy as v naught v1 all the way up to vn so that's n plus one vertices see watch one two n plus one right cool so if i tell you what boundary n does to something like this you extend linearly and then you know boundary n so what boundary n does to um uh something like this so if we have f going from here to here then boundary n of f okay this is supposed to be an n minus one dimensional simplex so it's going to be the sum from i equal to zero to n of negative one to the i f restricted to the face of this simplex with the ith vertex deleted so v not v1 dot 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 vi here this guy deleted, so I put a, a dumb hat on it. The face opposite VI, exactly. And we keep going all the way up to VN. And we put signs on there. Because signs are great. Do you like it? And then we extend linearly to define the boundary homomorphism, boundary map on um, all of CN. <clears throat> now, uh, what we get then is a very important This is a formal sum here. Yeah, that's exactly right. This is exactly of the type of the type of object that we want to see. Yes, exactly. Yeah, these these objects right here are singular n minus one simplices. Exactly. Uh, because it's nice. It's nice to have those signs so that um, Like what you would kind of want is if you had two simplices, like imagine you had two triangles. Oh, very good. That's a, probably a better reason. But if you had two triangles that were kind of glued together along a face and you want to think of that, like you want to be able to have a good notion of these two boundary pieces sort of canceling one another out. Anyway, yeah, but a better reason, very good, a better reason than that is the following theorem, which I'm not going to prove. I wonder if anybody's ever proved it. Has everybody say, I'm not going to prove it? Oh, wait, before we get to that, sorry, before we get to that, we what we can now do is write down a sequence of these maps, okay? So we can have a dot, dot, dot. We have a CN plus one here, X, which maps to a CN of X, which maps to CN minus one of X, which goes all the way down. By the way, this keeps going. There is a eventually a C zero of X, and then shoot, a zero here, just, so it keeps going. And each of these maps here are the boundary maps. These boundary maps here. So this would be a boundary of n plus 1. This would be boundary n. This would be boundary n plus 2, etc. cetera. 
And now here's the theorem for all n boundary of n plus 1 after boundary of n. So note that boundary of n, wait, what have I done? Did I write it backwards? I wrote it backwards. Um, boundary of n after boundary of n plus 1 is 0. Is in other, so what do I mean? I mean it's the zero homomorphism. Why, LOL? You get to prove that. Enjoy! It actually seems not that hard, but... It's a good exercise. It's very good for you to do this at least once in your life. These are the words I'm supposed to say. Yes, very good. So, theorem. Consequence. Consequence of this theorem is that then the kernel of boundary n. So, consequence of this fact. Or corollary. These are the words I'm really supposed to say. Is that the kernel of boundary of n. Remember what that is. Of course, I know you know. It's the things that are killed by boundary n in here. Well, that has to, that sits. Oh, no, no, no. Excuse me. This contains inside of it the image of boundary n plus 1. These are free abelian groups here, okay? So shouldn't worry about the following definition. So now define hn of x to be equal to this mod that. The key ingredient here is this object, which is called a chain complex. Okay, sure. So the elements projected into your n simplex from the n plus 1 simplex it bounds are projected to the zero element of cn minus 1. Am I not mistaken? The elements projected into your n simplex. So remember, these are uh, this is a free abelian group on n simplices. Okay. And by the way, just terminolo terminology, the elements of these things are called chains, n chains or n plus 1 chains, or n minus 1 chains. The elements of the kernel of boundary of n are called n cycles. They're called n cycles. Whereas the elements of boundary of n plus, sorry, the image of boundary of n plus 1 are called, um, well, they're called boundaries. They're called n boundaries. n boundaries. n cycles uh n homology good so where does this terminology come from so what does an n cycle look like so it's something whose boundary is zero so let's just draw a really dumb ass example of this let's just think about one chains one chains look like this they look like you know like lines connected by vertices. So here's a one chain, but it's not a, a cycle. It's not a cycle because the boundary of this is non-zero. The boundary of this, with depending on orientation, would be this minus this. But we can make it an n-cycle if we close it up and make it into a cycle, 
right? So the boundary of this one cycle, one chain, excuse me, the boundary of this one chain is zero. And so it's promoted from just merely being a cycle to now be what? Sorry, what did I just say? From merely being a chain to being a cycle. That's what I want to say. Now, is it a boundary? Whether or not it's a boundary depends on if there is a two, a set of two simplices, whose boundary is that. So what might that look like? Well, maybe you have um, two simplices like this in green. And you can see then that the boundary of the sum of these five two simplices would be this one cycle. And so this one cycle is zero in homology, is trivial in homology. It's contained in down here in the denominator, gets killed in homology. Wait, why is this a one chain? And why is it in the kernel when it's a cycle? Okay, so let's go, let's, let, I'll say it again. It, it's, it's valuable enough, I think, to say it again. I want to say it again. Here it is. This is what a, maybe a one cycle looks like. It's the sum of this one, one simplex, this one, one, I'm going too fast. Let me slow down and say that again. This is what perhaps a one chain looks like. It is the sum of this one simplex with that one simplex and that one simplex. This is a one chain. But this is a one chain which is not a cycle. The reason is because if you apply the boundary map to this guy, if I call this maybe A here and call this B, if I apply the boundary homomorphism to this, then I get A minus B, for example. Maybe if the orientation looks like this. Which is not zero. That's my point. But then suppose that instead of this one chain, we were going to look at this one chain. It doesn't matter that it's a pentagon. I don't know why I draw a pentagon. I just like pentagons. Then take the boundary of this. What you will find is that it's zero. And doesn't this look like a cycle? Doesn't this feel like the word cycle is, is um, appropriate here? Hello? I'm computing this bo uh, the boundary of this using this definition. Sure, so, okay. So let's say that we had this. Let's say we had this. Here's B and here's A. We'll call these ones guys, these guys here C and D. Okay? Then the question is what's the boundary of this? So what we do is we apply the bound because what, what we have in our in our possession is a description of what the boundary map does to each simplex right we know what boundary n does to a, a single singular one simplex And I don't know about, but up to, okay, whatever. I'm a little unsure about signs here. And it's linear. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm a little unsure about signs, but here's what I want to say. If we apply the boundary map to, to this simplex right here, what we should get is A minus D. Do you agree? We're gonna, it's going to be head minus tail is basically what's happening here. A minus D. And then we have this piece right here. 
which is going to contribute. So we add to this D minus C. And then we're going to do the same thing here. Add to this uh, C minus B. But then you compute all this. And of course, the Ds kill each other. The Cs kill each other. And what you're left with in the end is A minus B. The b which is sensibly, please, the boundary of this one chain. So in particular, if A and B are different, which I'm trying to um, depict a situation in which they clearly look different. When it's a loop, it all cancels. Exactly right. Andika Rosari, thanks for the follow. So when it's a loop, or what we actually call a cycle, it... Uh, it, it, it is killed by the boundary map. In other words, it is in the kernel of the boundary map. So this guy right here is a one cycle, is my depiction of a one cycle. Why is a formal sum of continuous functions from our n simplex into x thought of as a bunch of n simplices glued together at, at the boundary? Right, so they're not necessarily glued together at the boundary. Here is, I can draw for you another um, one simplex, uh, sorry, singular one, or one chain. Singular one, I can draw for you another one chain. Here it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. This whole thing here, okay, is a one chain. And here I have two times this guy, okay? This whole thing here is a one chain though. But we can apply the boundary map to it, can we not? And it's definitely not going to be zero. What was the name of this theorem? It's called homology theory. It's not really a theorem. But what is this represented as a formal sum? Uh, so if I, I, I mean, I could write it down. If I call the, 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 this, if I call this singular one simplex F1, this one F2, F3, and what do I mean by this? I mean that F1 is the singular one chain which takes the one simplex and maps it to exactly these points with a continuous map and f2 is similarly this and f3 is similarly this then i can just write this thing is equal to f1 plus f2 plus 2 times f3 You don't get torsion in vector spaces. And when they're connected at the boundary, how would we represent that? When they, so, I mean, yeah. Like this situation? As a formal sum. I guess I'm confused. So, this, like, if we could give names to each of these simplices, or rather, names of the continuous maps into these one simplexes. Is that what you want to see? 
Like if I called this F1, F2, and F3, it would be F1 plus F2 plus F3. No? Okay. So like uh, if we had like a cycle like this, for example. Yeah. Nobody. So, so right. They were connected in this case. They're not in here. They don't need to be connected is the point that I'm trying to make. The requirement that they be a chain, well, a chain is a very loose thing, okay? Enormous space of chains, absurd space. There is an absurd space of chains. You never want to really be thinking about chains, not really. It's just too big and monstrous, okay? So what you do is you focus instead on cycles. Homology only concerns itself with cycles. Cycles being things for which, which, which kill the, which are killed by the boundary map. Chain equals two, three, four a plus five minus five six seven b. Sure, if a and b are simplices, are singular simplices? Yes, absolutely. It is. Oh yeah yeah. I feel like we're getting hung up on this, um, this point. Too much. Complexes of simplices in X, for example. Should my intuition be thinking of like complexes of simplices in X? Complexes? I'm not sure. I feel like what you should be seeing are like worms like this. If you're thinking of one simplices, if you're thinking of two simplices, you're seeing like triangles in there and they might be all bendy or whatever and weird. If you're thinking about three simplices there are, you know, tetrahedra in there. Um, and it's just the free abelian group on such, which is very difficult to think of all at once. So you don't do that. But if you really need to, you just think of like, <laughs> it, it, it's really, really big. I mean, just think about zero simplices, okay? What is what are zero simplices? It's essentially the free abel. Oh, sorry, zero chain. What are zero chains? And what is the uh, what is C zero of X, for example? C zero of X. What is that object? It's the free abelian group essentially on points of X. So you can think of it like maybe points counted with multiplicity. Like you take a finite set of points in X, you attach a, an integer to each one. Right, I am saying that. That be, Because what is a cycle? A cycle is a thing that needs to be killed by the boundary map. This is dependent on the choice of functions. Like these functions start and end at the same place. Well, it definitely depends on the choice of functions, right? Because different functions give rise to different singular n simplices. And so they would be different objects in this group. You'd have a, a whole, a whole Z devoted to each 
each and every possible continuous function of the of the n simplex into x again this is unimaginable this thing don't try to imagine it it's too big and ridiculous it's absurd okay it's totally ridiculous so maybe what's miraculous is that when you boil when you focus your attention instead of thinking about all n chains at once you focus on the n cycles and then you mod out by n plus 1 bound or n boundaries excuse me and what are n boundaries well so here's an example of an n cycle i hope you'll agree if you were to take the boundary of this you would get 0 an n cycle, ooh, sorry, an n boundary or a boundary, a one uh, a one boundary. If this was a one boundary, what that would mean is that there would be a set of two simplices or a chain of a two chain, which when you take the boundary of it, gives you this cycle. So what might such a um, what might such a boundary look like well I, I mean what would it look like for this to be a boundary it would look like this you have two simplices like this maybe i shouldn't have colored that in but what i'm trying to emphasize is that these interiors are included because when you were, if you were to take the boundary of this two chain, you would get the one chain, which is this pentagon. So this would be in the image of boundary sub two of, of this map when, when the subscript is two. So in particular, the, the pentagon it's a one cycle okay it's in the kernel of boundary one but it's zero in homology it's trivial in homology because it's also in the image of boundary sub two So this is the sense in which homology counts holes. Holes. Yep. So like if you think so let's think of yeah so uh um sesquipedalianistic came up with a good suggestion which is to think about h0 for a sec h0 so what do zero chains look like zero chains look like collections of points So let's say we had a like this zero chain right here, that point and that point right there. And maybe we have signs associated with it. Can I just work in Z mod two, please? Can I do that? Is that okay? So that we don't have to worry about signs. Then when is uh, this, when are these two points here? When does this zero chain arise as the boundary of a one chain? 
Well, it would if we can connect these two points together using a continuous map of the one simplex into x where the boundary which connect these two points together and so what h so in other words these two uh points here okay maybe this is a better way of saying it these two points here are homologous they represent the sorry i should say i apologize this is a better way of saying it here's a one uh, sorry here's a zero chain just that point right there here's another zero chain just that point right there are they the same in homology they're different as chains but are they the same in homology well they are if we can draw a continuous path between them a continuous one simplex which connects this point to that point if we can do that then they are the same in homology they're what are called homologous homologous but we can only do that if these two things are are lie in the same path component in the same connected component of uh 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 of x so what h0 counts no if if they are in two separate components of x then there's no continuous path yes right so when are two points the same in homology homology when there it that's when the two points can be arise as the image of some one simplex yes zero say zero zero in homology yeah zeros and identity with attitude <laughs> that's that's really true right yeah yeah it's zero so the thing to to the thing to start to try to believe is that h0 counts connected components it's going to be a free abelian group and the rank is that the right word the rank will be the number of connected components of your uh, topological space path connected component whatever Was that what if there was a hole inside that pentagon over there? Good. So what if there were um yeah, what if there was a yeah. Then this would not be zero in homology anymore. This would be a cycle which is not a boundary. And so it would be non-trivial in H1. Non-trivial in H1. But as drawn right here, that guy right there is trivial in H1. The pentagon is trivial in H1 because there is a boundary. So think about, let's think about, for example, a torus, the surface of a donut. There is a hole in the donut, right? There is a curve which goes on the inside part of the donut around. And I think that what you'll find is that is a cycle, a one cycle, which is not a, a boundary. It's not a one boundary. So it represents a non-trivial element of first homology. There's another one as well, which goes around the torus like this.
cycle, but not boundary. And in fact, H1 of the torus is generated by those two cycles. Those are good representatives for the, uh, uh, those are good homology classes for, um, which generate the, uh, the homology group. Oh, a zero cycle is not very interesting, okay? Because we, okay, sorry. Um, it's something that's killed by boundary zero, okay? But what's boundary zero? Uh, it's just the zero map. The boundary of a point is zero, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just realized, I think we went 45 minutes on this. Is that true? We went hard. <laughs> Probability examples? I don't know. I'm not a uh, probabilist. Probabilist. A probabilist. A probabilist? I'm not a probabilist. It's a big machine, very big machine, Skugget. And you should understand, just just for your own culture, your own understanding of the culture, that really where all of this stems out of is this chain complex. And this special fact that there are these maps whose which when applied one after the other is the zero thing. Because then you can always form this homology thing, right? Forget about all the topological bullshit Suppose that you are just dealing with a chain complex. That's what one of these things is called. Then you can define homology. And in fact, a lot of the homology theory that you're going to learn, like you're going to learn about relative homology, you're going to learn about um, uh, the long exact sequence in homology. A lot of this stuff comes out of sort of more general set of ideas called homological algebra, which I know you've probably heard of. And it's just your first brush up against homological algebra. But as you keep going in algebraic topology, you're going to see gobs and gobs of others, of other um, chain complexes, like Meyer via Taurus, uh, some other places too. Very very algebra, very algebra, lots of algebra. If you think of a one chain as something connecting its endpoints, modding out by the boundary cons corresponds to moving one endpoint to the other. Sure. Do I have a certain method for taking notes or studying when I'm learning something? Um. Here's one tip that I think I'll put out there just to see how it lands with you all. So when you're reading a paper, uh, for example, or may, even a textbook, let's say you're reading a textbook or something, um, I think it can be very easy to get super stuck on a particular detail that
that you don't understand. Like, oh my God, how the, f how did they do that? How, what did that deduct? How did they do that from line 57 to line 58? How did they do that? And you're just irredeemably stuck. You're just stuck. You don't understand what happened, but it happened. And you are grinding super hard. Okay. On that thing. And you're stuck. I think like a really good thing to do is to just move on, mark it and move on. And maybe an even better thing to do than that is before you attempt that grind to understand all the little details, you look at the overall structure of the paper, say. So there is typically, I don't know, this is always the case, but there's typically like a main theorem. Like the reason that you're reading the paper is that main theorem. And what you might, as a student or as a reader, what you might be interested in is really the method by which they prove that result. Now, it's important to dig into the details, of course, but I think if you have a sort of um, overall sense of the structure of the paper, how the various, let's say, lemmas, if they identify them as lemmas, add up to maybe how those sort of things hang together to uh, prove the theorem, if you get that kind of sense, then you're you're pretty far along. Then you can, I think, maybe dig down into the small details of uh, what's going on uh, in the fiddly proofs of the thing. That might be a strat. Another strat is just writing shit down. Because I, I feel like I'm, whenever I write shit down, I always, know it better another strat for studying or uh, you said taking notes is that your question about taking notes another strat for studying that i think is very effective which is controversial very spicy take here in this channel uh ask yourself why though here it is make friends with your classmates friends did you hear me Friends, don't be scared. Friends, make friends with your classmate, classmates or colleagues or whatever. And then, yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, this is fully expected. Um, make friends and then go out of your room. Oh, wait, uh, meet them up, meet up with them on Zoom <laughs> or on Discord, okay? And talk, talk talk with your voice box about math okay and teach them math or be, so just talk about math like maybe pretend you're a teacher a teacher you're the teacher and you're teaching them something okay and let the they better be forgiving of your of your pedantry, okay? But try that because I guarantee you, you know what you'll learn? If you don't understand something very well, if, okay, if, <laughs> sorry. If you don't understand something very well, talking about it is going to uncover that fact real quick. OK, you are going to l figure that out real fast if when when you're trying to explain something. OK, you'll know where the holes in your gap holes and gaps in your knowledge live. And then you can go and crush those later by <laughs> looking at a book. So make friends. Make friends. Oh, here's another thing you can do. Go on Twitch. Attract an audience of people that just want to see your down, um, that want to learn from you. Then you can teach them that way. Okay, I think I've said enough. Ariana's Gari. You type bang, hey, people, you type exclamation point join if you want to join.
Can you help me solve a question? F of x equals log one plus x. Use Taylor series P4 to calculate an approximate value. Okay. So by Taylor series, um, Taylor series centered at zero, right? So uh, let's find the Taylor series. Find uh, or the fourth. I, I imagine what you're saying is the four degree four Taylor polynomial uh, centered at zero of f of x equals log of one plus x. <clears throat> Okay, so what would the degree four Taylor polynomial, what would that look like? It would look like a uh, f of zero plus f prime at zero divided by one factorial plus f double prime at zero divided by two factorial plus f triple, pr oh, what the fuck am I doing? This needs an x. This needs an x squared. F triple prime at zero divided by three factorial at x cubed. And then finally, the fourth derivative of f divided by four factorial times x to the fourth. I think this is p4 of x for this guy. Are you comfortable with this so far? Oh, but I thought C was zero here, Ariana's Gari. No? I just assumed that C was zero here. It's two? It's not zero, is that what you're telling me? Please tell me, because I don't want to do this problem if uh, I'm doing it wrong. And actually, it, yeah, two, one, zero might be bad, I don't know. It's centered at two. I know you're supposed to approximate log of two. I get, oh yeah, what? Oh yeah, Skaga is smart. God damn it. Fuck. Look at that. Oh. When this goes on YouTube, which it never will, or it might, if I magically figure out some way of generating more time in the day, that whole thing will be cut out. I insist that this, uh, s the center of this Taylor polynomial is zero. Okay, Ariana's Gari, got it? Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, so what was it again? So we had f of x equals log of one plus x, right? Calc math keeps telling me that I need to um, put all of my, all these VODs on YouTube. And he's probably right. I'm assuming it's a he, I don't know for sure. Uh, anyway, so if we want the degree four polynomial, right? Um, degree four Taylor polynomial centered at zero. Then 
this is for sure. It's f of zero plus f prime at zero times x plus f double prime at zero uh, divided by two factorial times x squared plus f triple prime at zero divided by three factorial times x cubed plus f fourth derivative divided by uh, at zero divided by four factorial x to the four power. Prime is derivative, yes. We're finding the degree four Taylor polynomial. Look, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what's gonna happen here. I have no idea if this thing, well, whatever. This is Taylor series, yes. But Taylor series is usually spelled with a Y. So let's just compute some stuff. What's f of zero? I don't know. Looks like log of one to me, which is zero. Now let's figure out f of zero, uh, f prime at zero, this term, f prime at zero. So we have to take the derivative of this. So first, let's figure out f prime of x. So this is like a divider, a divider. f prime of x, uh, well, we take the derivative of this, that's one over one plus x, you agree? And so therefore, f prime at zero is equal to one. That's cool. f double prime at x. Oh my God. So I guess I should think of this as being, this feels like to me, one plus x to the negative one power. So then I power rule this stuff and I get negative one plus x to the negative two or negative one over one plus x squared. Does that feel good? Are you with me, uh, Ariana Zgari? Because th th these are the nuts and bolts. I don't want to over. I don't want to skim them. Do you like that I did that? Do you like what I've done, or is it making you mad? Be honest. Oh, you like it. Okay, so I guess f double prime at zero is negative two. No, it's negative one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. That's nice. So you can avoid the lengthier division rules for derivatives. Good. Yeah, yeah. I. It, it is nice to do that. Definitely don't. You'll hurt yourself if you use the quotient rule. Next one, triple prime, f triple prime of x. So the way that I think about this guy here is negative one plus x whole thing squared, or negative two. I take the derivative of that and I get, so the negative two and the negative one get married and become a two divided by one plus x to the third power. Do you like it? Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. And so what is F triple prime at zero? It's isn't that two? And one last one, the fourth derivative of x. All right, you know what? I'm so tired of this. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going, but you, Ariana's Gari, must tell me what the fourth derivative is. 
because I'm not going to do it. Je refuse. Oh, is it six? Well, so wait, tell me what this is, though. Is it negative six? Tell me what this is. Don't be like my son, okay, and try to skip steps and do things in your head. Tell me what's happening here. It seems like there's some question. Is it six or... Well, if you just tell me what the fourth derivative of x is, then we'll really know. Yeah, do it. So I'm asking about the fourth derivative of x. So what you would do is take the derivative of this guy. So I'm asking, what is the derivative of this guy? What do I write right here? It's catching on. It's catching on. Very good, Ariana Skarik. Perfect. So it's negative 6 over 1 plus x to the fourth. Exactly right. And of course, as you know very well, the fourth derivative of that, so in, rather, the, this thing evaluated at 0 is negative 6. So now you know what you get to do now, right? You get to plug these numbers in, 1, negative 1, 2, and negative 6. Oh, and 0 here. So this f of 0, now we see it's right here. Uh, this guy is right here. This guy is right here. Right? Yeah, this guy... is right here <laughs> and this guy here is right here and so you get to plug in those numbers all right and uh, that gives you a degree four polynomial then you're gonna plug in two for x and i have no idea what the answer is oh true there is a cool ass pattern here I'm wondering maybe if that's the next part of your exercise. Okay. Hey, the queue is cleared. We did it. Hey, I don't have a lot of experience with these types of problems. The highest level of math I got to was linear algebra and differential equations. I was wondering if you knew what branch of a question. The user, uh, I've been trying, uh, what? I, uh, code wars. I might already be familiar with many smartphones that allow me, excuse me, to use a geometric pattern to unlock the device. You need to connect a sequence of dots or points in a grid by swiping your finger without lifting it as you trace the pattern through the screen. The image below has an example of a pattern of seven dots or points. For this kata, your job is to implement a function that returns the number of possible patterns starting from a given first point that have a given length. More specifically, for a function count patterns from first point length the parameter first point is a single character string corresponding okay blah 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 for example count patterns from c of length two have only uh should return five because there are five possible patterns sorry i'm not c to b c to d c to e c to f and c to h the others are not possible because you can't get to them in a straight line without hitting one of the other nodes first.
Yeah, this is combinatorial. So if you want to know the field that you would use, the field of math, the field would be mm, combinatorics, I would say. In a pattern, the dots or points cannot be repeated. They can only be used once at most. In any pattern, two subsequent dots or points can only be connected with, a direct, stra with direct straight lines in, I in either of these ways, horizontally, vertically, diagonally, or, this is weird, this is really weird, passing over a point that has already been used. And the reason why that's admissible here is because we've already used the letter E. So what you need to do is for every, you need to have like a table of accessible points from every point. So from A, you just list like B, D, E, and I, uh, or sorry, B, D, E, F, and G, H. And, oh God. Maybe what you need also is a list of inaccessible points which become accessible, like a list of inaccessible points with a reason, a reason why they're inaccessible. And then if the reason, the reason will always be a single point, at most a single point. I guess there also, another reason might be because You've used it already? This is so gross. This is like computer pro. Sorry. Never mind. I don't want to insult anybody. I love you all so much. Yeah, I agree. This is a programming problem for sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's the feeling I just got. But I feel like it's doable. You just have to think carefully about it. <laughs> it's a shocker, I know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Combinatorics. What? Whoa. Whoa. Listen here, I have no recommendations for combinatorics books, but combinatorics is very, very big, okay? It's very, very big. So you might, what you're looking at is a needle in the haystack that is combinatorics, okay? I just wanna warn you, I'm not trying to deter you exactly, not exactly, from studying combinatorics. But I just want to say that if your purpose is to solve this problem, if that's your whole goal, then uh, maybe think up a different strat. Okay. It's the journey. Oh, well, you know what? That's baller. I respect that a lot. So, and I'm glad there are people in here that can recommend books because I'm very ignorant of the state of combinatorics literature. I have a book by Brualdi, but I cannot bring myself to recommend it. Did I read the manga guide to linear algebra? No. I don't think I've ever read a manga in my life. I know what they are. They're like backwards books with pictures, right? You like read them backwards for some reason. Oh God. Okay. 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 We're going to look, we're going to look copy link address.
Hey, that's my last name. It's very common in Japan. This is not me. Unclear whether I'm related to this individual or not. This looks like this looks like go. What's happening? It looks like they're on a go board. What the fuck? <laughs> okay. I guess, is this a whole thing? I didn't know it. The Manga Guide to Physics. The Manga Guide to Calculus. The Manga Guide to Statistics. This is a whole thing. We need the Manga Guide to Category Theory, clearly, right? The Manga Guide to Databases. The Manga Guide to Linear Algebra. Jesus Christ. Okay, can we get to it? Wow, it's hyperlinked in everything. Hanamichi University. Say ya. I. Nothing to be. Oh, am I reading it in the backwards? Am I supposed to read from right to left? How does this work? And also, am I supposed to have the whole... I'm probably supposed to have the whole page on the screen at once. All I know is it's it's like backwards. Do I? Am I supposed to read the panel? Like, how does it work? Turn 90 degrees and read it. <laughs> Where's the math? Where is it? What is linear algebra? Okay. Okay, that's all for today. Osu. Osu is an interjection often used in Japanese martial arts to enhance concentration and increase the power of one's blows. Bow. Osu, thank you. God damn it. Yuri no. Still alive, eh? Osu. You're free to start suit tutoring my sis after you've cleaned every cleaned the room and put everything away, alright? She's also a freshman here. But since there seem to be a lot of you this year, I somehow doubt you guys have met. Wobble shake. I told her I'm not good at reading these. Thump. I wonder what she'll be like. God, what a beta. Ow. Oh, what? What does this mean? What is this supposed to evoke? Oh, he's hurting from his training. Is that what's happening? Why is he hurt? He's hurting from his training, right? That's what's happening here. Can we agree? She looks a little like uh, Tetsuo. Um, excuse me, are you Reiji Yurino? Huckins, thanks for the follow. What? Pleased to meet you. I'm Misa Ichinose. Sorry about my brother asking you to do this all of a sudden. No problem, I don't mind at all. How could this girl possibly be his sister? But I had no idea that I went to school with the famous Reiji Yurino. Well, I wouldn't exactly say I'm famous. I've been looking forward to this a lot. 
would it be awkward if I asked you to sign? What the fuck is happening here? Like an autograph? Only if you want to. If it's not too weird, it's totally weird. No, it's my pleasure. And then they touch hands. Gulp. This is very relatable for a lot of you, isn't it? So, sar. Huh? Re. Something. Can't quite figure out what's happening here. Oh, sorry, Misa. But I think I'll head home a bit early today, says this guy. Big brother. Urino, rem you remember our little talk? Yep. With the salute. An overview of linear algebra. Let's get to it. Well then, when would you like to start? How about right now? Let's see. Your brother said that you were having trouble with linear algebra. Yes. I don't really understand the concept of it all, and the calculations seem way over my head. It is true that linear algebra is a pretty abstract subject. And there are some hard to understand concepts, linear independence, subspace, basis, but the calculations aren't nearly as hard as they look. And once you understand the basics, the math behind it is actually very simple. Really? I wouldn't say it's middle school level, but it's not so far off. Oh, well, that's a relief. You said it. But I still don't understand. What is linear algebra exactly? Uh oh. Um. Er. Hey, you see what's happening here? This is what I'm talking about. You try to teach somebody this stuff. Okay? You try to teach somebody this stuff. And you find the holes in your knowledge pretty goddamn quick, okay? That's a tough question to answer properly. It really isn't, okay? It really isn't. Really? Why? Well, it's pretty abstract stuff, but I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> From three dimensions to two dimensions. From two dimensions to three dimensions. From two dimensions to the same two dimensions. Broadly speaking, linear algebra is about translating something residing in an m-dimensional space into a cor corresponding shape in an n-dimensional space. Oh. We'll learn to work with matrices and vectors with the goal of the general of understanding the central concepts of linear transformation, eigenvalues, and eigenvectors. I see. These are twin summits. So, what exactly is it good for? Outside of academic interest, of course. You just had to ask me the dreaded question. Look at him, so deflated. While it is useful for a multitude of purposes indirectly, such as earthquake proofing, architecture, fighting diseases, protecting marine wildlife, and generating computer graphics, it doesn't stand that well on its own, to be completely honest. Oh? And mathematicians and physicists are the only ones who are really able to use the subject to its fullest potential. Aww! <laughs> if anybody- hey! Doesn't anybody have a math question? Who out there has a math question? Oh, look! Vienna Wazek, you've got a math question. Let's go. G of X is the periodic 
function shown below. What is the period of g of x? Okay, so I assume that these are unit length unit length things. Like this is of length one, right, Vienna? Like one, two, three, one unit grid. Where is say it? Oh, I ignored it. Because it was a little blurry. Okay, thanks. So I guess the period is one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. I think it's period seven. Do you agree with me, Vienna? Great. So name six values of x where y is equal to one. Is that half, you think? Is this x equal to half? Okay, cool. What's g? No? Oh my god. <laughs> no, I... Wait, I'm asking what's the x coordinate of that point right there? God damn it. <laughs> okay, what's g of 53? So. You, uh, of course, what you're going to do is use periodicity here. So G of 53 is the same as, I think you'll agree. So, okay, what's the, this is my thought process. What's the biggest multiple of seven? What's the biggest multiple of seven less than 53? Less than or equal to 53. What's the biggest multiple of seven, which is less than? or equal to 53. Yeah, 49. In other words, and in particular, 53 is 49 plus 4, right? So because this has periodicity 7, this is 7 periodic or whatever, if we want to say it like that, then the value of g of 53, well, okay, so let's write something down here. Uh, g of 53, obviously this is g of 40, not, hey, chill, Yoshi, plus 4, right? G of 53 is G of 49 plus 4. Okay. And because G is periodic, 7 periodic, this, can, can you believe that this is the same as G of 4? Because it repeats every 7. So we can basically uh, declare that the value of G at 53 is the same as the value at four. So now we just use our eyeballs in the picture. We go one, two, three, four, and then we go up, it looks like two units. So G of 53 is equal to G of four, and G of four you can read off from the graph. It's already been two hours since you told me that you would end the stream in one hour. Yeah, but why do you need my computer again? Install Discord. You said you would do it. Oh, you want me to install Discord. Okay, okay. I also have to get um, that food. Yeah? Okay.
Is that clear it up, Vienna? I get it, Yoshi. I will end the stream very soon. Hype. All right, so listen. I have things to attend to. So I, I usually end the stream in about 23 minutes, but things must be attended to. And so I am going to leave now. Uh, um, with this. Anyway, I love you all very much. Uh, thanks to y'all for hanging out. God damn it, Yoshi. Stop. Yoshi, stop. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, thank you all so much for hanging out. Uh, I'm going to do this again tomorrow. I hope to see you all either tomorrow or on some future stream. Anyway, it's just been super, super, super fun today. Um, We'll have more fun like this in the future, okay? Hey, y'all. Peace out. Love y'all. Hope to see you soon. Bye.